Hey everybody, welcome to the Queen Comedy Podcast. Welcome to 2024. It is uh it is 2024 right now. I am very surprised that it is 2024. I didn't feel like 2023 was gonna end. Um, and just for full transparency, I tried to do this interview in 2023. It didn't go how we wanted. So now I'm bringing this person back. They were so gracious to come and do it. Um, if you don't know about my guest, he's a teacher, he's been doing stand-up for a long time, he's a storyteller. Uh, he has a dry bar comedy special. Uh, he's just a hilarious guy. And I found out about him because when I started comedy, uh, there was a class uh, about stand up and he was on there and it showed videos of him. And so I actually like dug, went down the rabbit hole. And so he was like a person that I really learned from uh, because of this course. And so now he's welcome, Mr. Claiborne Cox. Welcome, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. I, I'm so excited. Like, I, I know that we tried this before and it didn't work how I wanted, but like every time. Uh, I see you or I see anything pop up. It, it gets me excited because like I said, you're one of the first people that I saw that used some, some kind of system or training or whatever to learn stand up. And I was like, okay, so this guy's smart. He's funny. He's talented. He used a system to be able to get better at stand up. So he took his natural ability and blew it up into something else. You have a driver special or whatever. What pushed you to actually start stand up though? Like what, how did you get to stand up? So, um, well, I think that we comedians were comedians before we made it official, right? I mean, so like you were a funny person before you officially declared yourself to be a comedian, right? They were just wired like that. And then the the facts that we're comedians kind of reveals itself over time, you know? Um, so, I, I mean, I just told stories uh, in college. I was asked to tell the same story over and over and over again. And I enjoyed it. It was fun. And the, you know, the people who heard it seemed to enjoy it and, so I became a school teacher and um, told a lot of stories. And the students honestly seemed to enjoy that better than they enjoyed my my teaching. And I enjoyed it, too. And so um, one night I decided I, I had watched. Uh, have you heard of Bananas before? I've heard of it. I've never been to a, to a Bananas, but I, I, I heard, I've heard of the comedy club. OK. Well, OK. So there is a comedy club. There used to also be a TV show. I think it was on like. Uh, uh, kind of smaller network, but not an unheard of network like PBS or something like that. But okay. um, it was uh, Thor Ramsey. Are you aware of Thor Ramsey? Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, he was the host of it, and, okay. and and everybody was on it at the time. I had never heard of any of them, um, but like Tim Hawkins and all the all yep. the uh, the pillars that you know we've both tried to kind of follow and things like that. So I watched it and these guys made it look so natural and easy. And I thought, well, I mean, I, I tell stories. I could do that. And uh, I, I, at the time, did not think of it as a craft, which um, when someone mentioned that the stand -up comedy was a craft and it almost made me mad. Like, what are you, what are you talking about a craft, you know? Um, and then over time, learned that they were very much right. And so anyway, this show Bananas, it, it kind of was the spark that um, – made me switch over from being an unofficial comedian to uh, someone who would have at least attempt it. So I, I tried at a um, local coffee shop to just have a story night. And I told people, look, I'm, I'm not teaching anything. I'm just going to tell story after story after story. And it was um, reasonably well attended. And it was fun. In hindsight, I, I doubt it was a great show, but it was good enough to be fun. And so one thing led to another and here we are <laughs> <laughs> now so so you think that there is an innate uh comedian inside of all comedians that there was like that that little seed was planted a long time ago and either some of us grow right and go be comedians or we kind of take it like in our day-to-day -day and add humor to to the world when did you know that you were funny like was there a time like in your childhood where someone's like oh you're funny did anyone ever say to you like oh you're funny you should be a stand-up comedian like did you get those kind of comments growing up uh well i don't remember <laughs> if other people told me or if i just thought it myself but i did think <laughs> it myself so uh i you know in fifth grade i got voted for two things and one of them was class clown but they they wanted everybody to get something. And so they took away my class clown and gave it to somebody else. And that really bothered me, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I, they gave me whatever the other thing was. Um, but, yeah, I was an only child. And so um, I did not have siblings to tell me that I was not funny. And that was enough to encourage me to continue trying. So that that's funny because in fourth grade, 
I got stuck in uh, the corner with a dunce cap. I had a teacher that was really mean and didn't like me, like making the class laugh or act up. So I spent all of fourth grade uh, stuck in a corner. So I had the complete opposite of nobody wanted me to be the class clown. They were never going to give me that title ever. So, um, <laughs> but I had people growing up as I got older would say things to me like, oh, you should be a comedian. Oh, you should be a comedian. And I was all, and I didn't realize that the path of comedy was just anybody could do it. I assumed you already had to be famous mm. to be a comedian. So I was like, well, I don't want to be an actor, right? I don't want to be a movie or whatever. I don't want to be on SNL. I mean, I would love to like write it or whatever, but I was like, I'll never, I guess I'll never be a comedian. And then I came across that course. I came across you. I started seeing more stuff. I went out to clubs and was seeing live shows and talking to comedians afterwards. And I was like, oh, you could just go do it. Like anybody could do it. So that's great. Now, you, right. you mostly do stories. Does... Is there, I hear comedians go, well, I can't tell a story because it's too long or there's not enough pieces to it. Do you think that the setup punchline style of comedy lends itself to storytelling and that you need to know that structure before you go to stories? Or do you think you just tell stories and then add punchlines as you go? That's a good question. Okay, so like uh, to give a football analogy, um, if you were incredibly fast, but you weigh 40 pounds, you're, you're lacking something. The speed is a good thing to bring to the table. The, the, you know, the bulk is not something that you have. Vice versa, if you weigh, you know, 500 pounds, that there are assets to that in football. There's also some um, detriments to it. You know, you're probably not going to be extremely fast. So both and, I mean, I think is the, the answer. So in a story, what you cannot do, and you know this, James, but some of the listeners may not, you cannot do what a lot of people do at like a Thanksgiving table um, or, you know, just a, a normal party setting, um, which is fine in that context. It is to tell a, a five minute story. And at the end, you get one laugh. You can't do that. Right. And stand up comedy, not going to work. Um, but, uh, you know, if you just tell one liners, unless you're just phenomenal at it, um, like uh, Tommy Smothers or, um, uh, uh, uh Dimitri Martin or someone like that, um, it can feel hokey, kind of cheesy, you know. And so having the robust uh, depth of a story with the the quickness of the the one liners, if you can do both, uh, then that would be ideal. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. Now, when you start, when you create new material, you're creating new material. Do you start with an idea, or do you start with a story that you already told before? Like, what's your process for developing new material so that's a great question um i used to write a lot more um jokes and uh honestly it, it was kind of a labor a little bit i enjoyed it to an extent but it it didn't fit my grain you know and so um more so now with either a concept that i genuinely think is funny and just, just want to flesh it out or um, just a story, and then of course you can beef it up and things like that. And, you know, you know, we're we're entertainers, and so we can beef up and exaggerate and things like that. If people tell me later um, or want to talk about it later, I'll tell them the truth um, on the <laughs> stage. I guess I think of it as a as a it's a play. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing fictional entertainment at that point, but but there's a lot of nuggets of truth inside them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because I, like as I tell people, and I, maybe you agree with this, or maybe you don't. I love to hear. You. I always say that your setup has to be rooted in truth, right? Like you can't go say, "I fought Godzilla yesterday," right? Godzilla doesn't exist. No one's going to believe you. So when you get to the punchline, the rest of that, they're already they're already lost. They're already going. You, Godzilla doesn't exist. You can't fight Godzilla, whatever, and then they're not going to believe you, and you're going to lose the whole thing. So your setup has to be in truth. Whatever you say after that, whatever leads to the punchline can be as embellished as you want because people already know this is the truth. This is the part that you're going to make up and make funny. Right. Do you feel that? That's right, right. Yeah. I I'm sure it could be done where someone is just so weird and out there that they could get away with it. And of course everybody doesn't buy it, but that's maybe their shtick, you know, right, right. but, but uh, in general, for sure, just, uh, uh, it's, it's always funniest if we at least believe that it really happened, you know, and I'm all about telling people the truth, but again, we're, we're entertaining. And so, um, uh, yeah, whatever is funny, is funny. <laughs> Another point. So, you know, how both of us, we were talking about how we were, 
probably comedians before we ever made it official. It's necessarily a reason not to pursue comedy. It may be that one's not funny or they just might not like you or something like that. You know, and so I've heard that from one person who did not particularly probably more often than I should, you know. Um, and uh, also, if you only hear from like, you know, your mom that you're hilarious and that's the only person on the other side, maybe get more feedback from a broad spectrum of humanity because there's a weird comedy is a flavor thing there's going to be people who probably think you're really funny and there's probably going to be some people who don't it's good to get a wide spectrum of input does that make sense yeah yeah because i mean yes you while you have a fan base you have a certain kind of person that might like your comedy there you have to get here from other people because you're not going to, every show you're going to do is not going to be just your followers or just your people who like just your comedy. They're going to be a wide spectrum of people. Like we, I did two shows uh, for New Year's, right? It wasn't my crowd. I wasn't, you know, they weren't there to see me, but I was on the lineup. Uh, they were there to see Don Friesen and Fritz Coleman, who are fantastic comedians. And, but I can perform to anybody. And so that's what I, I have learned is like, these are, jo- and some jokes that I tried that I did in the first show went really well. That in the second show, when I did them only kind of got mediocre stuff. And so I did the one thing that you're not supposed to do as a comedian when you're bombing, which is try a new joke, right? <laughs> do not ever do that. But I tried this new joke because I'd already kind of ran it past people. I was like trying it. Cause I just got my wife uh, uh, made for Christmas. Like one of the things she wanted was she's like, Hey, can we, can we get a maid? But she spent, but I talked about how she spent two hours cleaning before the maid got there. Right. And I, and I talked about like, if a guy gets a maid, like if a girl gets a maid, they clean and they do all these things. I don't want the maid to think we're sloppy. And I'm like, but if a guy got a maid, he would like throw out his extra Doritos, put more socks on the floor, probably dump out the garbage can and be like, I'm going to make her earn her money. Right. And then people like got on board with that. And there were people like pointing to their spouse, like, oh, my wife's done that. And I was like, oh, okay. So it was good to try something that I hadn't tried before. Play with. By the way, that wasn't the, the whole joke. That was just the gist of the joke. There was more stuff or whatever. But it was just one of those moments where I was like, oh, they don't like, when I'm talking about my daughters being cheerleaders, what they, they're like not getting, it's like an older crowd. They're like, not really interested. I'm like, okay, so I did that. And it was fun, but that, that wasn't my crowd, right? The earlier crowd was there and they were on board with me talking about my kids and whatever. This crowd wanted to be more about wife and husband stuff and more about spousal thing, which Don Friesen murdered on later on. So I was like, okay, but learning to play different crowds is a skill that all comedians need to go. Like, how many hell gigs have you done? Have you done a lot of hell gigs? I I cannot count. Of course, <laughs> who who hasn't? It's but that's one of the best growing gigs, right? When you do those gigs and they're terrible, you come away with something better than if you just went to a show and you murdered, right? Like, don't you feel like you you learned more, you grew more as a comedian? Oh sure, yeah. I, I, the worst ones are the ones that feel like that when you're doing what should be a, a well-paid show. And I've experienced that too, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, I, I'm sure some of it is is on me, just my fault. And some of it, I mean, yeah, goodness, I, some crowds are just really hard. <laughs> some people are just, I mean, they're like ice. I don't even, maybe they came in with a bad day or every room has its own synergy. And so, um, you know, if for whatever reason there's a bunch of strangers that come into the same room and they each collectively just have decided today was a hard day and I don't want to laugh in front of these strangers, then I, they're, I, I, that's a winnable game, but it's it's a hard to win game sometimes, you know? So yeah. one, one of the worst shows I ever had was with Marty Simpson and it came on the heels of what at that point was one of the best shows I've ever had. And so um, it was the first time and maybe only time I've ever flown from one state directly to another without coming home in between. And so I had this show in Wisconsin and it, it was phenomenal. And I just thought at that point, this is years ago, I got it. I figured it out. I'm, I'm <laughs> funny now. I, I win all my games, you know, and then I flew to South Carolina and, um, this is the Oreo cookie thing. A couple of nights later, I had another show in South Carolina that was also really, 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 really fun. However, between those two, um, there was a crowd who, um, there were multiple comics on this uh, one show, and they liked the others, and I felt good. Like, well, they like these others. I I just 
It's had one of the best shows of my life. I've got it now. Obviously, this crowd is going to love me. And they did for about two minutes. And then it was like <laughs> someone flipped a switch and they just went cold on me for whatever reason. Maybe I like maybe I said something to someone in the crowd jokingly that they didn't realize was just, whatever the case. They decided you're not funny anymore. And so I just ate it for way too long. And then <laughs> Someone else, like a sound guy or something, he had another microphone in the back of the room. And he was like, your time's up. I didn't even get to my closer, nothing. I just had to like, just stop and walk off stage in shame. I got heckled after that show was over. It was, it was bad. Wow. I don't think I've had that, but man, that would, that would be rough. I could see that, that really like, did, so did you, was there a moment of you rethinking like your, your career as a comedian where you like, well, maybe, maybe this isn't for me after all. Like, did you have that moment? At I'm all? sure it at least flavored it. You know how it is. I mean, after a show like that, you're not totally 100% like 10 minutes later. That doesn't happen. Like that just weighs on you until the next show. After the next show, I was pretty okay, but it took a little time to recalibrate. There have been a few shows like that. I had a, I had a show with Henry Cho. The first time I ever did a show with Henry Cho. Are you familiar with Henry Cho? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love Henry Cho phenomenal and so um the first time i did a show with him he blew it out of the water because he's henry cho so of course he did and uh i did not have a particularly good set it was well below average and i really wanted to impress henry cho you know and uh, i did it and it was one of those nights like should i even be doing this it, you know but of, of course it, that doesn't stick you know yeah because and especially when you bomb in front of someone that you like, you you like, are like, oh my gosh, this person is amazing. I want them to like like me, or I want them to see me do well. You know, whatever. I want to be their friend. Whatever it is, yeah. That moment you have that, it's terrible. I I did a uh, last summer. I did four shows in Laughlin and I uh, opened for Craig Shoemaker. And first show, good show. Second show. I got in my head and bombed, dude. I ate it so bad. And it literally, I thought about, and I, this is the crazy part. I went back to my hotel room and I said, I'm just going to drive back home. Like, I shouldn't be here. Like, this is not, like, li literally, that's what I thought. I, like, talked to myself where I was like, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just find a way to get back home. But I had two more shows left. And so I was like, all right, well, and I talked to my wife and I talked to a couple of comedian friends. Like, dude, just, it's one show. You're fine. And I'm like, yeah, but if this get what if this happens in the next three shows? And I'm like, okay, well, you didn't die. So you're okay. I'm like, all right, but I didn't want him to see me bomb, <laughs> right? Like, I didn't want to see that to happen. And then the other two shows, one went good, and one just was like one of the best shows I ever had. And the sad part is, it's the one show they somehow didn't record my set, like video wise, because it was an amazing show. I like wrecked the room before he got on stage, and I was like, yes, I was like, I cannot wait to get this video. And they're like, oh, we didn't record that. They, like, we started recording afterwards. And I was like, come on, man. So, but. That was one of those things where I didn't want to bomb in front right. of somebody who had one entrusted me to come on the road with them for four shows. It it sucked that bombing was like one of the worst things ever. But you have to go go. All right, I've got to do another show because right, you can either do one of two things: you can quit, right? You can say I'm not this. I'm this. Is, I'm done. I guess I, I'm not good at this. Or you can go. All right, that was one show. Let's go see what happens next show, and then go back out there and do it again. And why we don't like to blame the crowd. Sometimes it can be the crowd. Sometimes it can just be you. Sometimes it can be how you told it this time or whatever it is. But those moments are what make us comedians, right? Those moments of ups and downs. That's also the hard part about being a comedian is the ups and downs, right? Of like, oh, that was a great show. Oh, that was a not a good show. That was an okay show. Oh, I could have done better. I could have done worse, you know, whatever. And you just kind of like, it's a constant roller coaster. The um, now you do comedy and teaching. Do you get that with both of those or just with comedy? I think comedy typically is more of the extremes. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're, I, my class, we, we get along really well and I, I love them. Um, but there's 28 of them consistently. I'm never going to get 500 people in my classroom <laughs> laughing at me all at once. That's not going to happen. You know, so there's extremes um, and and uh, vice versa. Oh, before I forget, I will yeah. say, so the, the good news about those terrible shows is, A, I've never met someone who didn't have them. Never. You know, and so um, the... They they just happen. So if you have if you're listening and you're new to comedy and you just are coming off a bad show, well, welcome to the club. You know that's uh, that we've all been through it. 
But B, okay, anybody can stand up in front of people and read jokes. Or no one doesn't have the capability. You can form those words, same words that Tim Hawkins says. They will be less funny than when Tim Hawkins says them. The way that he feels that role is just off the wall crazy. I, I heard one person who said, if if you just read Tim Hawkins' jokes, you might laugh out loud at one out of three or something like that. But if you sit and watch Tim Hawkins perform those jokes, you will laugh at 1,000% of those jokes because he he feels that role, right? And this has been like a sigh. He was like, look, I like you. Um, you did some things wrong tonight. And he taught me some things that I've never forgotten since, like how to host and things like that. And there's another guy named Jim, Jim Hope. He said one of the most interesting things. He said, look, you're new to comedy. Here's the thing. Um, like you're building armor. Until you've built it, you're just kind of vulnerable up there on stage, you know. And over, and of course, it can vary. Five years, it could be less. It could be more depending on stage time and things like that, you know. But he said, you're building the armor. And over time, you, you've you got armor, um, which is jokes and, and material, you know, um, and according to his metaphor. But he said, um, after even longer the the armor just becomes like your skin. It becomes who you are, and you can fluidly move around in this armor. But it takes time for all of that. It takes time to build the material armor, and it takes time to learn to like uh, distribute this material in a fluid way. And, and that it is a time consuming process. But anyway, I never forgot those two things from that from that long dreary night. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the thing. So if you had to start comedy over today like say you're starting comedy for the first time but you get to bring all the you, old current you goes back in time and tells young you starting out uh one piece of comedy material or advice what would that advice be um what people used to tell me and i fought against for, for years they would say your vance point do material i tried to fight that because I, I i think at the time i thought well i, I want to lean and I want to like keep that very, very distinct and separate from my school teaching. And eventually I became not ashamed of the fact that I was a school teacher. I liked it and I started to embrace and lean into that. And it was revolutionary. It, it's, it's like, again, just fighting against my grain. And all of a sudden I started going with my, my natural God-given um, vantage point. And, and that helped tremendously. That would be one thing. Um, Another would be, if you are a school teacher, here's the deal. Um, or, or if you're doing a job like that, that, that has to do with a lot of people, we do not have the advantage of writing. Someone who's a full-time stand-up comedian, um, they have time and know-how and skills to write jokes all the time, and they're really, really good at it. I, that is not an advantage I have. I'm, I'm, I've got you know, 40 hour work week, but, um, I can do crowd work all day, every day. And so I started leaning more into that. And I, that is an advantage that I have over a full-time comedian. I'm not saying I'm better at it, but I'm saying I get more experience and practice at it, you know? So there's that. And then social media, um, I've started leaning more into that recently. And, uh, you know, I mean, you don't have to do comedy only on a stage. Um, the world is kind of a stage now with the internet, you know, and so I'd, I, maybe I would have started leaning heavily into that earlier than I have now. So, yeah, well, I guess maybe Shakespeare was right. All the world's a stage, right? We should have, been, we should have taken <laughs> it that, feels into, that way, right? We should take that into account decades ago, I guess. So it, it is what it is. Well, Thank you so much. Where can everybody find you, Claiborne? Where can they see more of your stand-up? Where can they watch you and connect with you and find out where you're going to be doing shows and stuff? Um, my website's got pretty much everything. It's Claiborne Cox, not Claiborne. A lot of that. It's not Claiborne. It's Claiborne. C-L-A-Y-B-U-R-N-C-O-X dot com. Um, Claiborne Cox Instagram. Um, if you're on TikTok, I do not have a TikTok account, but my students do. And they will put me under hashtag Mr. Cox. And that's been a fun ride. I enjoy doing TikToks with my students between classes. And so hashtag Mr. Cox, if you uh, if you have a TikTok account. 
That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'll put all the links in the show notes below. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great 2024. Listen to this. Go back. We have 365 other episodes. So that's one episode a day you can listen to if you wanted to now. A year worth of, of free comedy content with all kinds of great comedians like Claiborne and tons of other great people. So check it out. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Please like, subscribe, and have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great 2024. We're excited. Bye.